This is a brief video showing examples of student models that were submitted uh, for the daylighting structural design assignment. This first one will be an example of a very satisfactory submittal. This is a steel trust rigid frame. Uh, it actually was rendered in wood because working with steel in model form is very challenging and fairly expensive, um, but nonetheless it can be done pretty well in wood. So there are several things to notice here. One is that there's a very thick joint here and the structure cantilevers out from there to this point which is about 20% of the overall span and something similar is happening from the other end so there's a thick joint here with a cantilever going out to that point. Um, if we did a moment diagram under uniform gravity loads we discover that there's a zero moment point here and here. On the other hand, under wind load or any kind of shifting live load, this is no longer a zero moment joint. So the structure here still has some depth, although the depth here is much less than the depth here uh, because the moment uh, that occurs under all the different uh, possible load combinations, the maximum moment that occurs here is much less than the maximum moment that occurs at this corner. You'll also notice between here and here that the structure is thickest at the center. So you can think of this as more or less a simple span from this joint or this location to that location. So the structure cantilevers out from each end and then at some point a different moment condition takes over. So in this zone we have um, negative moment, meaning we have tension on the outside, compression on the inside, the same thing over here, compression on the inside, tension on the outside. And then in this zone we have what, for the purposes of this course, we're calling positive moment, which means we have compression in the top and tension in the bottom. This convention, by the way, of positive and neg negative moment is not universal. There are some fairly uh, distinguished schools of engineering and architecture which reverse that uh, and they have reasons for doing that. Um, one of them is the University of, University of Illinois. Um, however, for the purposes of what we're doing here, we're going to stick with the more common convention of saying we have positive moment from here to here and negative moment on these end portions. Uh, one of the things you'll notice on this structure is that um, the bottom cords and top cords are fairly wide. Now we've shown previous structures where we have fairly uh, narrow flanges top and bottom. These flanges right here on the inside are in compression. They tend to want to buckle laterally and the way we do that is we take struts and brace those struts between the edge or the the cord of this uh, truss here up to the purlins in the roof. In the case of this particular model this student chose to render the flanges or the cord members of this truss fairly wide so that they would be laterally stable and I think I have a better view of that. So here this portion which would be in compression is laterally stabilized by its own width at that point. From a daylighting point of view it should be pointed out that that wall is opaque. That would be an east or west wall and the wall that's been omitted here would also be opaque but it's been removed for purposes of illustrating the structure and allowing access to the inside. Um, in this particular model uh, there's some question about which direction is north and south. We don't see any particular overhangs to reflect that so that is a, 
something of a deficiency in this model from a daylighting point of view. It appears to be fairly symmetric relative to um, north and south. Another slight deficiency is that these purlins, which support the roof decking, are not occurring at joints in the truss. So it's pretty rare that we would load the truss with a purlin that doesn't land on the top of these. And in fact, the spacing of the purlins is a bit irregular, and that would be considered a deficiency. On the other hand, the top flanges have been rendered as fairly thick, which means they're pretty decent bending members. So these purlins could land between two points there and still uh, not cause excessive stress in the top flange of these trussed frames. However, it would have been really nice if these purlins, those members spanning between the trussed frames, had been spaced in a more regular way and had landed on truss points or joints, which we sometimes call vertices, or connections, or panel points. Uh, but generally speaking, the purlins have the right proportions for the distance they're spanning. This portion of the truss frame has the right proportions in terms of depth to span. Uh, this cantilever has the right proportions in terms of thickness at the base to distance that is cantilevered out. Uh, and the issues of lateral stability have been attended to fairly well. Also, the amount of glazing and the distribution of, of glazing has been fairly well handled in the structure. So this would con be considered uh, a fairly satisfying uh, submittal for the purposes of this particular assignment. Most of the remaining projects will be more in the nature of examples of what you might not want to do, although a few of them will be also, will have some positive features that will get pointed out along the way. This particular structure is a bit uh, puzzling. We have a fair amount of glass here and in the triangulated opening on the other side. So when we come here, we look through and we see that not only do we have this big triangle, but we have one on the other side. Uh, in the case of this project, we were never told what north and south was, which is a huge deficiency. Uh, that should be clearly identified so that we can understand the meaning of the glazing openings. Um, the other thing that's a bit puzzling about this is we have this strange little dormer that's uh, popped up. Um, and let's see if we can come up with another view of that. So you'll notice across the edge of this dormer there's essentially no beam, but there's corrugated decking coming up. So this is a classic example of either this purlin is unbelievably shallow or we're not even sure there's a purlin there. It's so thin, in which case, of course, the decking is attempting to span from that support point to that support point, and corrugated decking simply doesn't span in that direction. So one of the key things that we want to get across, and we'll mention this several times through, through the uh, duration of this video, is that you need to think about how corrugated decking is supported. It only spans in one direction. So point forces like this in the nature of columns coming up to support decking isn't satisfactory. And there does appear to be a tiny little beam across that edge there, but it, if it is, it doesn't even come close to meeting our spanning proportions for beams. While we're talking about spanning proportions, you'll notice that these purlins, and purlins by the way are uh, another version of joists. Joists are, are beam-like elements or, or open web elements that support decking. So in this case, the purlins are running in the correct direction to support the decking. Uh, 
where the corrugations of the decking are spanning in this direction. Uh, these purlins, though, have exactly the opposite problem of whatever that little beam up there is, in that these purlins are only spanning from rigid frame to rigid frame, which is a fairly short span, but they're very deep. And so they're uh, grossly oversized for their function. Uh, also, we tend to try to not uh, make purlins too deep. And by the way, to finish that point, a purlin is a joist which has a slope of its cross section like this so that it can come to rest on the top of some sort of rafter or in this case a uh, sloped frame. So this joist which is rotated over to the side is called a purlin. That purlin has a tendency to collapse over to the side and so we often want to uh, stiffen the web where it's supported to prevent that overturning from occurring. But in addition to that, the last thing we want to do is pick a really deep beam because the deeper it is, the greater that tendency for it to overturn under the force of this decking, which is a vertical gravity force which can be translated into a force in the strong direction of the purlin and a force in the weak direction. And so really deep purlins are not what we want to do. And that's certainly one of the places where we don't want to add extra depth because the extra depth actually becomes problematical. Okay, so the primary structure here we can think of as this rigid bent and this rigid bent which together form a rigid frame. Now, this structure is an example of a redundant structure in that in addition to the rigid frame action that's associated with these thick joints, we also have this member which we can think of as a tie member. And this tie member is helping out in that under gravity load this member is tending to go that way and this member is tending to go that way and they're being tied together to create a triangular truss of, some, of uh, a certain sort here. Now, this is really redundant because this whole thick joint here was designed to prevent that outward movement and make this frame work well. Now, the other thing we'll notice here is that there's a cantilever here which is attaching at this joint and is tending to counterbalance the effect of that cantilever. So this cantilever and that cantilever are more or less balanced over this joint. And then there's a similar one over here that is balanced over this support. And then those two things are connected together to keep them from flopping the side, from side to side under wind load. So when we look at the balance of all of this occurring over this support and the balance of this occurring over that support, this tie member becomes really redundant in that it's not really doing much of anything. It could have been left out, or better yet, it could have been rotated horizontally to help support the upper edge of this wall against the inward pressure of wind that's going in this direction. So there are two really huge concerns about this design. One is most of the glazing seems to be in this triangle plus the triangle on the other side, um, which would suggest those are the north and south directions. If that's the case, there is no overhang over the, north, over the south wall, which means that the triangle is not very well protected. And then this strange dormer is popped up, and assuming this is the south side, then that dormer is facing west, uh, which seems uh, an unfortunate choice. If this dormer was facing north, then this side would be, excuse me, if this was facing north, this side would be west. If this was facing south, this side would be east, and the other side would be west. But no matter what direction we choose for the normer, dormer, if we make it either north or south, then our predominant glazing orientation, which consists of this triangle plus the triangle on the other side, that, that glazing is all facing east and west, which are not our preferred orientation. So we have 
we have problems with uh, orientation of the glazing and and the issue of overhangs. Um, but in addition to that, we have enormous heat train issues because this is all steel frame and all of this exterior uh, beam connects through this thick joint there and there and there and there and there and similarly on the other side. So we have huge heat trains through the thermal envelope associated with this building. Now those heat trains have been fairly common in architecture for quite a while uh, because we had lots of cheap energy. But those heat trains cause uh, disturbing issues like condensate on the inside. So on a cold winter day when that steel gets cold, it condenses moisture out of the interior space and that moisture can drip on people or it can also cause corrosion. Um, but aside from that, it's just a huge uh, source of energy loss. So one of the challenges you have as young architects is to figure out how to solve some of these problems, which we have not traditionally dealt with very effectively. And I might add, I might, I might not be pointing out all the problems with every model, but I'm trying to hit the highlights of some things that are of concern. Um, this project, there are several things to comment on. One is that rainwater that comes down between these long linear apertures on the uh, roof monitors tends to pile up on the black back side of one of the monitors. In other words, it's tending to run down towards the glass. Um, the way we normally deal with this is to put a curb there so we actually build the glass up. And for such a long, uh, narrow pathway, particularly where we have water pouring off of this portion and water running down off of that, there's a fairly rapid accumulation of water against the glass on the back side of this monitor. Uh, that curb needs to be fairly deep, and then we put in something called a cricket, which slopes the roof from the center line down to here and then from the center line down to the other end. There's no evidence of either curbs or crickets on this particular design. There's also not uh, clear shading to distinguish what's north and south in terms of these monitors, and that should be done. Another issue is that uh, even though these frames are spaced out a bit further, these are really huge, deep purlins. So we have a similar problem to what we had on the last example where the purlins are deeper and more prone to overturning than is desirable and they should be more in appropriate proportion. Uh, one other thing that's a huge factor on this building is that these frames um, are not well rendered. A rigid frame needs to have a great moment connection at the corner. At the very least, that means these flanges come and get attached together, and those flanges do. The flanges are what are handling the bulk of the moment at this corner, and when they fail to engage each other, all those stresses get transferred through thin web members, and this would be a catastrophic design. Uh, we sometimes also, in addition to wanting these to come meet and be welded together at that corner and that corner, we may also want a diagonal stiffener um, because these two are in compression and tending to drive into this corner. These two are in tension and are tending to crush the web uh, at, the, at this corner in a stiffening member that holds these two flanges out and these two flanges in uh, would be helpful. But right now the most catastrophic thing is those flanges are not even meeting to do the job that they need to do. It's a pretty nice interior space. It's violating our rules though because when we add all of this glazing and all of that glazing plus everything in the roof we have more than we need. Um, some of that could be rationalized on the notion that it's view glazing, um, but if that's the case, then these one of these walls is the south wall, and it needs to have 
uh, an overhang and some kind of light shelf to alleviate some of the burden of all of that light. This structure has some fairly uh, spindly trusses in it. Um, they might be thick enough, but they look a little on the slender side, particularly some of the long uh, vertical web members and, and also the diagonals. Um, you'll notice that this has been rendered, that the truss seems to end right there, and then these elements tend to get added on. Uh, that might happen in reality because, in fact, we don't want the truss just sitting on top of a column here where the truss can flop over. So one way is to run the column all the way up through. The other issue is these little elements here are very lightly stressed. They are not part of the primary action of the truss. Um, it's not uncommon for them to be fabricated as a continuum of this top cord and maybe even the bottom cord, but that's not done for structural reasons, it's done for simplifying fabricational issues. So the rendering of this truss as sort of attaching to the side of this column and then this piece as an addition that's attached after the fact is a valid way to do things. It seems odd to some students and they sometimes question it, but uh, and there are other ways to do it. Um, but it's not a fundamental structural flaw. You'll notice a bunch of linear elements here that are used as bracing elements for the bottom cords of the truss. The problem with that is that they go to a very thin truss at the end. So you have a whole bunch of trusses, all of which are vulnerable to buckling, and they're all very similar, and they're all connected together and those bracing members simply assure that they're all going to buckle in the same direction but it's not really going to brace them in any significant way. So there needs to be some cross bracing to activate those bracing elements so that they can actually uh, stabilize something or there needs to be a deep horizontal beam or something or other or even the bottom cord could get braced so we could have cross bracing between two adjacent bottom cords that would provide some lateral resistance so that these members don't move all along the length of the thing. Um, so the bracing pattern in this structure is really suspect. Another thing you'll notice, and we'll talk about this again in a moment, is these appear to be purlins supporting the decking. Those purlins are unbelievably shallow. They're like a 60 to 1 ratio they make absolutely no sense as bending members supporting the structure. And the ma another major flaw in this structure is you'll notice here we have shear walls and then just for extra measure we've got lateral bracing. So relative to movement along this length, in other words into the image that we've got here, um, this is like a super uh, stabilized structure. This is what I call the belt and suspenders approach. Don't have one, have two. Um, on the other hand, what's really peculiar is relative to movement in this direction, either this way or that way, we have a little stiff knee and another stiff knee and those are coming to fairly weak points on our trusses. There's not even any bracing at those two points. So if these members go into compression, they're going to tend to destabilize the bottom cord of that truss at that point. So we have very, very weak bracing relative to movement from side to side. But in the longitudinal direction, we're over-designed. So one of the things you should, you should point towards in your design is to demonstrate that you've addressed all these issues. And in fact, this building is longer uh, in the longitudinal direction than it is from side to side. So that means there's greater wind force in this direction than there is in that direction. And so if ever we needed greater lateral bracing, it's to restrict motion in the, in the uh, 
direction that's currently being braced by these little flimsy uh, struts. Okay, so now we're going to go look at, uh, this is a slightly different view of that same space, and now we're going to look at this, and you'll notice in this case they rendered the top cord as continuous across and then put in a little strut on the bottom, and as I mentioned, this is a kind of a cross between, you know, doing this whole thing as an addition versus doing the entire truss and then setting the truss on top. So what they did was, uh, they made their end bearing assembly right here, which is very reasonable. They continued this top cord extension, and then they put in a little brace here. Sometimes, if the cantilever is not too long, the bending capacity of this top cord will allow them to go all the way out here, and then this strut won't be necessary. The key thing I want to emphasize here again is that these purlins are unbelievably uh, shallow and they're supporting the corrugated decking and in fact in this model the corrugated decking is rendered as deeper than the purlins so if that's the case they should have run the, the corrugations in this direction and in fact the corrugations might have been deep enough in which case they could have left out all these purlins and run the corrugations this way This is uh, <clears throat> a bit of an odd structure, and it's a classic example of people wanting to do something that they feel has never been done, but also when you go to perforate a building or open it, you know, you, you entertain a lot of different options about what's possible, and this one is not a particularly good one. Um, <clears throat> One can imagine that the original truss form was a triangular truss um, that would allow a slope on all surfaces for rainwater. And also it has the advantage of being very deep at the center, so it becomes a very structurally efficient form. It's not quite as ideal as a parabola, but as we have mentioned in the past, it may be even deeper than the parabola, so in the end it's, it's actually very structurally efficient. Um, the problem here is that the top cord members, which would have been in compression here, have been removed. So the compression line that starts up here has to be diverted and go here. The dilemma with that is that it's pushing on this joint and the only resistance is this member and that member leads down to a f an effective thickness here which is only the thickness of the bottom cord in bending. So this is almost like a pin joint. Uh, that's the weak point at the center of the structure. Another way of looking at it is this force is coming in to a quadrilateral which is not triangulated. That quadrilateral could be stiffened up with a diagonal along here, in which case the stress path would be here and then there and then along there. Even if that was there to properly stabilize this structure, we've lost a lot of the efficiency because we were headed towards this really deep truss everywhere. And then right here where the depth would have been that, we've artificially truncated the depth down to here. So the stress path goes there, there, and up to there. Um, so it wouldn't have been a very good truss. On the other hand, this structure ended up working pretty well. And the reason is that the student who put it together ended up putting a beam here. So if you check this beam, it actually has a depth uh, to span ratio that's within reasonable proportions. Um, in which case, of course, we would interpret all of this red stuff up here as superstructures sitting on top of that beam. Um, it's probably not a very efficient way to span, and it's also uh, not the most logical way to open the structure up to admit daylight. The student who did this project intended to have a support wall here and then beams running across. 
and um, for various reasons that escape me, we periodically have obsessions with certain structural forms or building forms, and this so-called butterfly roof uh, was very much in vogue when the student did this. Um, in this case, these beams, instead of running straight across, run down and back up again. And so they, in the medium that this is built out of, which is wood, they've been sawn and glued back together at this point. And then these plates have been scabbed on each side. This is um, ingrained gluing, which is generally very unreliable. So it's not a very good moment connection, even with these side plates uh, scabbed onto it. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting, though, about this model is you'll notice that these elements, these verticals, which are intended to support these beams, when you trace them down to the bottom, you discover they're not even hitting the foundations. In other words, these are not support elements, they're actually hanging off of this structure. So it leads to an interesting question, which is, what is the nature of this structural action? And when you thump on this model, by the way, punching down on the roof to represent a gravity force, it's actually pretty sturdy. And the reason it's working reasonably well is that once this decking is glued on to these members. This piece of decking along with that piece of decking are forming a deep V beam which is spanning from this side to that side. In other words, the original structural action was supposed to go from this side over to that side but now it's coming from this side over to that side. Um, and the result is kind of unexpected because the roof is fairly sturdy. In fact, it's so sturdy that it effectively is supporting this edge along here. And these uh, intended columns are not really acting like columns at all. This is, by the way, a perfectly valid structural concept and has been applied in a number of different kinds of buildings. The major problem with it is that you have to have a reliable way to support all these beams until the decking gets attached to them. Because these beams are really stiffener ribs that are allowing this uh, corrugated roof to form an effective deep V beam. If you don't have those stiffening elements, then this thin corrugated material will buckle and will not work very well as a spanning system. Um, this model, by the way, has massive amounts of glazing, way more than would meet this assignment. In fact, one of these walls is almost equivalent to the floor area, and that means there are two of those walls, plus all this uh, east and west glazing. So this doesn't even come close to qualifying to meeting the daylighting assignment. This is a little bit better job. Um, in this case, it's not working as a deep V beam, um, or that's not the primary mode of action because the rest of the structure was pretty much designed the way it was supposed to be. Uh, here we have this box truss that runs from one side to the other. So this is the primary support point for the roof and the box truss runs from one side to the other. Um, these mullion elements were not intended to be primarily primary gravity resisting elements. This box truss was intended to support that or provide that function and then these cantilevers were intended to sweep out to support the roof. In reality though these vertical elements are serving as gravity resisting elements so we have a highly redundant system here where the box truss may be supporting these cantilevers if the box truss is the stiffer part of the system or it may turn out that the box truss is largely supported by these triangular uh, elements or this cantilever continuing on through over to that cantilever. 
So in other words, this truss, which I'm outlining here, consisting of this cantilever, its uh, connections through the box truss, and that cantilever in the background, they are being supported at that point and that point, that truss is, and it's attempting to support the box truss. And depending upon which is the stiffer stress path, that will be what's the primary support, uh, source of support. Um, without running a computer analysis, we probably wouldn't know that. Uh, this model was reasonably well crafted. It, um, it has a problem with massive amounts of glazing on all sides, drastically exceeding our guidelines for the purposes of this project. The source of lateral stability is also kind of tricky. Um, these elements right here and down at the other end are more or less planar, so they're not working very well as lateral load resisting elements, at least not in, in for forces along a parallel to this box truss. So in the end, all of these cantilevered columns are actually providing the primary means of lateral stabilization. They are braced by these shear walls and then they cantilever up. So they're like cantilevered beams and they're a bit shallow to be cantilevered beams, particularly on this side. It's not too bad over on that side. And when you push on this model, this side is much stiffer. When we push in this direction on the roof here, these uh, cantilevered vertical elements tend to be a bit more rubbery. From a lateral stability point of view, this is a sort of a suspect uh, concept. This is another view just to emphasize how much sunlight we're getting into this structure. This is an example of a structure that would never uh, be satisfactory for this assignment. Um, you'll notice super massive amounts of material up in the superstructure and then these spindly columns that are not very well moment connected at the base. So there's just a complete imbalance in the structure and it's not a very well detailed or elaborate uh, structure. But what we worry about is the failure of these uh, column-like elements which are going to go into severe bending under lateral forces. So that looks like this, where you're seeing this huge deformation down here. Even when we pushed on the top, there was no deformation in this truss structure, and all the deformation was occurring in those elements. This is kind of a neat concept. Um, these are truss frames, which are admitting light in through the roof but also through the sides. So this is a way of dealing with east light, for example, where you have mostly opaque surface and the opening is basically towards the south. So as you walk along the interior of this building, you get this rhythm of views towards the south and you also get beam sunlight through those apertures during the winter time. Uh, the flaws in this model are that this truss, for example, is pretty well braced on the top by this piece of material and on the bottom by this piece of material but when you get to the end of this process you need some kind of lateral bracing and you'll notice from the break in this truss that there was some lateral buckling and the truss did fail at that point and by the way from a modeling point of view this was a catastrophic failure because this was a piece of sheet wood thin sheet wood which was cut on a laser cutter and you cannot do trusses in that manner where you have crossing grain so we got crossing grain on these web members and even on the cord members we've got crossing grain and you need to have the grain running parallel to the length of the member otherwise it has really really weak fracture planes that will cause its failure so these trusses needed some lateral bracing at this face of some kind, but they also needed to be uh, made out of some other material for modeling purposes. In addition to all that, uh, these uh, roof diaphragm elements are not supported by any additional structure inside, so we're not really sure what kind of material they're made out of, but they're too thin 
for the spans that are involved. This edge is fairly stiff, as is that edge, but the interior part of this triangle is really quite weak. This is another example of a seriously, seriously flawed concept which would never um, pass muster for the purposes of this. Of course, you'll notice there's one truss on this side and another similar truss on the other side. This truss, relative to horizontal forces, the bottom cord of this truss is very weak. This wall has no structure behind it, so um, there is nothing spanning from the stable ground plane up to the stable roof diaphragm. Um, we have some vertical wall, we have some vertical truss, and there's a hinge line along the center here, which is basically the failure point for this structure. So under lateral forces, the wall and truss just bend inward and fail rather easily. The other thing you'll notice is these purlins are really long and really shallow so they don't meet any kind of proportioning standards. The other thing that's just mind-blowing is that the corrugations are not spanning from purlin to purlin but they're spanning in the other direction. So the weak purlins are causing this kind of drooping effect. We also have issues of uh, lack of solar protection and no clear indication of what direction the glazing is facing in. So this model is kind of a catastrophe from every point of view. Here's another one. You'll notice these roof monitors are spanning from there to there. Um, nothing on the top but decking. An unbelievably long span that's what that decking does. It doesn't meet any kind of standards for spanning. Also, you'll notice there's a single truss under this portion of the roof. So that's a T-shaped cross-section, which is a lot like an I-section relative to torsion. It doesn't work very well. So as a consequence, um, when we apply a load, I don't know whether you can see this, but basically this material, the roof material, is torquing at this point because it's only supported along the center line and there's nothing to keep it from torquing. This is a really bizarre uh, example. You'll notice some of this glazing is facing north, some of it is facing south, and then there's this break with the trusses. So we have uh, uh, glazing on this side and on this side of this trough which is facing uh, glazing that's facing east and west. The biggest problem with this roof is that um, every single one of these little sawtooths becomes a pool for collecting water. So the water drainage system on this would be an absolute nightmare. And getting water off the roof is one of the criteria for this building. We, we don't want you building buildings that are absurd from the point of view of shedding water. Um, you'll notice also part of this was painted red, green, white, etc. One of the interesting challenges for a sawtooth roof is you don't want really dark surfaces because they will absorb solar heat and that will drive the transfer of heat through the roof into the interior of the building during the summertime. So you'd like them fairly white. On the other hand, what, or, or highly reflective I should say. In this case, these are painted white, so that would seem to fit the bill. The problem with white is that it's diffuse and it's scattering. So overhead summer sun hits these surfaces and a lot of that sun, both the light and heat, bounces through the windows and um, causes thermal overload. <clears throat> Ideally, what we'd like on these slope surfaces is some kind of optical treatment that uh, bounces overhead light away. And there are ways to do that which we could talk about at some point, um, but for the purposes of this I would argue this red is not the appropriate treatment. This red will absorb about 85% of the heat, which means these surfaces will be really hot during the summertime, and that's going to drive up the uh, air conditioning load.
Okay, so here we have another um, take off on that theme um, where we, we have water collection issues down in the trough. There's no curb here. Uh, and anytime you have a sawtooth, you need a curb and a cricket that takes care of the water runoff. This model, though, also was quite uh, dramatic. I wish I had a video of it because uh, it's all based on moment connections and uh, they used hot glue which turns out to be a fairly rubbery and flexible joining technique so you could put your middle f finger in the middle of this model and deflect it down easily the depth of one of these uh, glazed panels so it was a very rubbery structure which did not express very well how the building needed to be working Okay, so these people actually put a north, north arrow on their model, which is absolutely crucial. And in their write-up, they made it clear that the uh, west and east walls would be opaque and that those were left off for the purposes of this modeling demonstration. This is an alternate view of that project. So with regard to forces in the north and south direction, these rivet rigid frames are doing the job. And it turns out that when you measure them off, they meet our uh, specifications for spans and proportions for steel um, frame structures, rigid steel frames. The lateral bracing in the other direction is a little trickier because we don't have a roof diaphragm per se. We have a bunch of these horizontal elements that are framing into those rigid frames. And so it's not exactly a diaphragm on the roof. It's more like a rigid frame between these horizontal elements and the rigid frames that they're connecting to. Um, and a structure like that can be problematical if you're, say, welding it or connecting it into the thin web of those rigid frames. Uh, in this model, it worked pretty well because those frames were rendered as pretty thick and therefore laterally resistive to whatever moment stresses were being induced by those horizontal elements. Um, but this would be a problematical issue and you, it would impact how wide the flanges have to be on these uh, rigid frames. And it would also um, be really criti critical that the connections get made well. Uh, from this point down, it's cross bracing, very poorly done. This piece is not coming to the center of action there. So craftsmanship wise, this is a pretty poor model, uh, but it has some interesting possibilities. Um, one of the things that was not clear in the write up and is absolutely crucial is, you know, what was the intended thickness of these things? and how are they made because right now they're just rendered as really thick solid material but since it was supposed to be a steel frame structure that seems unlikely uh this structure was kind of interesting this uh, student had these bow trusses to represent the rafters here and the rafters tend to splay apart but at one end here they're held together by a tie member because the wall was not installed on this end, when the student pushed down on the top, she discovered that there was a tendency for this to splay apart fairly strongly here. If this tie member at the end had been put in, the diaphragm action on this side of the roof and on that side of the roof would have allowed this structure to resist that tendency to splay outward. Um, however, uh, in response, she went back and inserted some pieces like this. Unfortunately, if we're really talking about spanning from there to there, which is what would be the case without a tie member across here, then this structure gets awfully thin near the middle where the moment is very high. So this patch job here didn't really solve the problem and she would have been better off putting a tie member across here. Nonetheless, it was an interesting model because it was uh, useful to demonstrate um, certain types of structural behavior. Here's another model. 
Here we have uh, an east-facing arch, which presumably has been, or uh, excuse me, west-facing, which has been partially protected by a major overhang. This is what that looks like in the middle, and here's an interesting thing. We don't have a ridge truss down the center. So, presumably these people are, uh, this was a model made by two of the guys in the class, and they expressed that that butterfly effect that we talked about on the previous model that was creating a deep V beam was their intended function here. So, um, the overall structure, at least, of the center of this is based on that deep V, and these trusses are basically stiffeners. They're probably deeper than they need to be to span from right there to up there. But the concept is basically sound. As I mentioned, though, you would end up needing to be able to support these trusses while you had workmen up there applying the decking and then these trusses have a fairly minor function once the decking is attached so that makes the whole structure less efficient than it might have been but it often turns out to be easier to just put a truss girder down the center here uh, because that makes construction a lot easier um, and there's no need for any kind of temporary shoring um, there's another major problem with this particular design which is shown right here. Here are those trusses under this uh, deep V beam. And I want to zoom in a little closer on those. And what I want you to notice is this edge of the deep V is relatively vulnerable to bending. And so we need a little bit of vertical support at that point. And basically, there is none. This is, these trusses are basically supported by the glass at that point. And there is such a thing as structural glass, but we don't typically use it to support major loads from the roof. This is a view down on the roof of another structure. Um, this person opened up some strange openings which don't meet any of our daylighting standards. Uh, what's also interesting, though, is to note the direction of the corrugations here. And then when you look under, you realize that the corrugations are spanning from there to there, and there's no structure going across to support them. So you normally would never do this where your corrugations are spanning in the long direction. If they're going this way, it usually means because there's some substructure supporting them that's spanning across from there to there. So, from a structural point of view, that's a completely unrealistic way to do things. This truss also had problems in that it was laser cut with crossing grain. Um, so, that part was relatively fragile. There also was a kind of obsession on the part of this student to sort of delaminate and separate everything, which is fine, except, uh, you know, it's the meeting of that shear wall with this shear wall at the corner that's the primary means of lateral stabilization and as I mentioned here you know the wall is has been removed to a large degree from the rest of the structure and the failure to intersect these planes or to compensate for that in some way resulted in this structure being uh, a bit wobbly from side to side Okay, so here we have a view of a structure, and this is a close-up of it, and you'll notice that down at the bottom, the bottom cords have been cantilevered out to support this deck. Then the corrugations on that deck have been run in the wrong direction. So this kind of bowing here is sort of symptomatic of the fact that decking's not really tied down properly to anything. Uh, and in fact, in the real world, this would be bowed downward, but because the structure is so light and because there's warpage involved, this decking is buckling upwards. But um, it's the corrugations are going in absolutely the wrong direction. Uh, this particular structure was also intended to be in steel, so the bottom cord uh, extension here uh, would need to be insulated or treated in some way to keep it from being a heat train. Uh, 
you'll notice at the top there's something really weird. First of all, note that the purlins are running this way, the decking is running that way, so at least up on the top the purlins and the decking are working together the way they ought to. There are two really weird things about this that I want you to note. You can't quite tell it from here, but actually the span between the trusses is less than the span between the purlins. So there's absolutely no reason to put those purlins there. The, the corrugated decking should be rotated so that the corrugations run this way and they should just span from truss to truss. The only reason you ever put in purlins is to reduce the span of the decking so that you can reduce the cost of the decking. But if in fact you've spaced the purlins further apart than the trusses, then you burden the decking more and you also cause yourself to have to buy the purlins. So you've paid for purlins that are actually making the situation worse relative to the deck span. The other thing that would be really logical then would be that you would just extend the top cord of the truss the way you did the bottom cord and there would be some structural integrity there. What's really bizarre is there's a break here. So the top cord is stopped and then an element is kind of glued to the side of this. So this would not be a detail that we would ever want to use in steel. We would much rather have the continuity of this top cord rather than break it and then have to have another piece that gets welded to this purlin and the purlin is not in a very good position to uh, withstand the torquing that's going to be introduced by this cantilevered element. But the other massive contradiction is just like this decking down here is not going in the right direction relative to these spanning members Similarly, this decking up here is not going in the right direction relative to these members. Um, this, this entire structure is a study in not understanding really basic things about how structural materials get put together to get a job done. Okay, here we have another curious structure. Um, we have fairly spindly purlins getting supported over a column. They are then cantilevering out and supporting this fairly heavy beam. That heavy beam is spanning across and then supporting this purlin. So this is what we call a very circuitous and irrational stress path where the burdens on this purlin gets transfer transferred to this beam which gets transferred back to a purlin that ultimately gets to this column. There's just no logic to doing that. Also, these vertical elements become bending members under wind load on this face. And right now what's happened is this horizontal element which has essentially no load in it and no structural function at this point is the one that has been allowed to be continuous which has effectively put a break in the middle of this vertical element so when one pushes on this wall with their finger to represent wind this column tends to bend and develop a crook in it. Compared to all the other issues, this is relatively minor, but this uh, corrugation is going in the right direction for resting on top of these purlins. Unfortunately, the purlins stop short of the edge, so this portion of corrugated decking is basically not spanning in an appropriate way to be cantilevering beyond. So that's another powerful argument for why these purlins need to continue out to the edge in order to support those corrugations. Here's another example of an imbalanced system. Here we have a pretty decent shear wall for resisting forces parallel to that wall. On the other hand, these appear to be typical um, pin joints or joints with almost no moment capacity. For winds incident on this wall, pushing in the direction parallel to this truss, the only obvious means of stabilization or moment connections to some sort of very wide footing at the base. These are awfully tall spindly columns for resisting that.
Also in the modeling technique, this column was just uh, end here. We had the columns completed by scabbing on pieces. So from a modeling point of view, it was not a very effective uh, rendering process. This is another view of these little stubs that got glued on to the tops of those columns. This is a rigid frame structure which uh, has been pretty well stabilized. Deep beams are moment connecting near the top and down near the bottom so that gives good stability perpendicular to the frames and then of course the frames themselves are always designed for forces parallel to their plane. Um, what's really puzzling about this structure is we've got roof corrugations that appear to be trying to span from frame to frame but then some purlin has been introduced in between and of course the purlin is running in the wrong direction given the corrugation direction so the only purpose of the purlin seems to be to delaminate and separate the uh, corrugations from the rigid frames which would be suitable to support those corrugations assuming the corrugations are deep enough to span from frame Here's another example of a structure that would never be satisfactory to meet the criteria for this project, but it illustrates something important. They have a half a bow truss there, half a bow truss there, and together they don't add up to a whole bow truss because they're offset relative to each other, so the bottom cord here is not active, the top cord there is not active, and the structure bo boils down to a hinge joint. <coughs> so. I drew on the outside of this model a column which would be crucial at every single point through this building to properly support these two half trusses because they cannot engage each other in the way that a bow truss uh, is intended to engage. Several comments would be appropriate on this. The first is if you're doing daylighting, don't make the interior surfaces of your building really dark and manage to brighten this up. Um, but in reality, it was a very dark space, even with this beam sunlight coming in because all the interior surfaces were too dark. The other thing I want to point out is this odd construction where some very, very shallow purlins are used to support these inverted bow trusses. So it's very odd to bring a large portion of the roof to deliver a load on this skinny, slender, shallow purlin member. It's also another example of what we talked about as a circuitous stress path. Uh, we have the potential for this elevated roof to very quickly bring loads down to the really sturdy part of the structure, which are these rigid frames. Instead, all that structure is offset in the form of these inverted bow trusses, and then the load has to be carried back through these purlins back to the rigid frames. So it's a way of creating a circuitous stress path where stresses are being carried along long paths uh, that it, are not the most logical or effective. That concludes our examples of illustrations of prior student work. Um, I should point out that I've focused a lot on negative things, things to be avoided because I'm trying to get misconceptions out of people's heads. Um, and I think it's been more instructive generally to show you what things don't work um, because you have plenty of examples in your books and also in precedents of things that do work. Um, there's a tendency, of course, to always try and invent something new and that's fine as long as you're aware that it needs to work and be sensible um, and you want to avoid some of these uh, pitfalls that we've been talking about. The other issue is that this year this uh, structural model is going to count for a very substantially larger fraction of your grade than it has in past classes. So I want you to be looking at doing work that's substantially superior to most of these examples that I've shown here.